So President Trump is at the G7. He's clearly at odds with uh, European counterparts as well as uh, with Chinese President Xi Jinping. But he's also at odds with some members of his own party, including yourself. So what would you like to see the president or how should he change course on the issue of trade? I think you should change course by focusing in on China. That's the real, where the real problem lies. I represent a constituency in suburban Chicago that is poised to lose if these tariffs go in place, particularly vis-a-vis -vis our allies. I have small manufacturers that are importing uh, specialized steel from Sweden, for example, and their prices are going to go up. It's going to hurt the employees and it's going to hurt the consumers in my district. So in answer no, to your question, yeah. pivot to China. That's where the, that's where the lion's share of the uh, of the egregious conduct has been coming from. It's so interesting. In the last segment, we talked to veteran Republican pollster Frank Luntz, and he suggested the same thing. You know, he knows nobody slices and dices Republican electorate mm -hmm. better than him. But let me ask you this. How does the president pivot to China at a time when he needs them to help with the issue of North Korea? So the president, I think, is basically a mercantilist. He really does believe mm. that if you raise tariffs on, you know, this country, then it's going or on imports, it's going to raise economic activity in this country. So to your point, there is a bit of, um, you know, a multi-dimensional element in his relationship right now with Xi Jinping. On the one hand, we want to enhance this openness with uh, with our trade relationship and the U.S. needs to get a better footing and access to the Chinese markets. They need to stop the kind of IP theft that we've seen that there's really no quarrel about. I mean, there's no dispute about. They're absolutely doing it. And they've got to lower the barriers of U.S. Interests, In other words, let us have access and lower ownership barriers. But that said, the only reason that Kim Jong-un is at the negotiating table, in my view, is because the Chinese are really putting, the, uh, putting harsh sanctions on Kim Jong-un right now. So, look, the president can multitask, and, and he's able to interact on this basis. But my view is this is not time well spent vis-a-vis -vis our allies. Instead, he should be focusing in on China. Should Congress try to curtail the authority that the president has, whether it's on China and the ZTE deal that he seems to have struck, or whether it's on imposing tariffs on allies? Well, the irony of Congress trying to do it is that it would require a presidential signature. So obviously, in this environment, <laughs> Donald Trump is not going to sign anything, and we wouldn't have the votes to, uh, to override that. So that said, we're very much in persuasion mode. So I was in meetings yesterday with Ambassador Lighthizer and with Secretary Ross, and I was giving voice to the concerns that I'm hearing from the manufacturers and employees and consumers in my constituency and trying to persuade them to say, listen, go a different direction and so forth. So in one sense, you know, they, they are listening, whether they're hearing us and they make subsequent decisions, the jury's still out. But I don't think it's going to be possible simply to impose a new trade standard over the administration because they've got authority under the law. Another issue that will be important for your constituents will be the tax package. Of course, you supported the passing of that legislation, but Democrats now seizing on uncapping the state and local tax deduction. I believe that your Democrat Democratic opponent is talking this up. Will the SALT deduction be your Achilles heel come November? No, I don't think so. Look, when it all comes down to it, you look at my constituency and they're the net beneficiaries of tax relief under this, uh, under this plan. Husband and wife, median income with two children in my district, that's, they get $4,600 in tax relief. According to our estimates, the property values are up 5% in my constituency, and that's all based on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. You've got Commonwealth Edison, the carrier for electricity yeah. or the provider of electricity that is now for the first time said, we're coming back and we're offering rate relief as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So this is good for my constituents, and I'm going to be running on this plan. Congressman, you represent suburban Chicago. You know this. These are independent voters, swing voters. I grew up in suburban Philadelphia. These are the type of voters that decide presidential elections. The president in recent days has suggested that NAFTA is no good, that he wants to pull out of it. He wants to just start all over, deal bilaterally with Mexico and with Canada. I, I got to ask you, a lot of the base of the Republican Party would agree with them. Even the base of the far left would agree with them. But do you think, Congressman, as someone who is so impacted in a district by NAFTA, is it smart for the U.S. to pull out of NAFTA? 
I think it's a mistake to pull out of NAFTA. I think the better move that's going to yield the better result in terms of economic growth and economic stability and prosperity would be to stay in NAFTA and update it and renegotiate it. But to walk away from it would be a mistake at this point. Now, if there were no NAFTA, would it be a good thing to just start at the very beginning and have two bilateral, bilateral relationships, one with Canada and another with Mexico? Perhaps, but we're not in that season. We've got NAFTA, and for NAFTA just to come unraveled, from my constituents' point of view, I think would be a mistake.